Hi, I'm Diane Dupuy, and I am the founder and CEO of Famous People Players. And it's certainly an honor for me to speak to you today, and who's ever listening, thank you very much. You're probably wondering who and what is a Famous People Players. Well, I'm going to tell you that story. Everything has a beginning, a dream that blossoms and grows, if you really truly believe in your dreams. It began for me when I was a little girl, not realizing at the time there was this dream in my heart. What it was, I had no idea what it was. But all I know is my very first day of school, grade one, I was so scared. I didn't know what to expect of school. And I walked into the classroom, and there was all these children sitting there staring at me. And then I, I got up, and I went over to them, and I said, Hi, I'm Diane Dupuy. And you know what? We have a wonderful playground here. I'm so excited, I can't tell you. Now I know what school's all about. We're gonna play outside all day long. This is so wonderful. And then I turned and I looked and I saw this tall woman staring at me. Who are you? Oh, you're the teacher. Well, when do we go out? When do we play? I'm, I'm so excited. You want me to what? Sit down. Hmm. That was so uncomfortable sitting down. It was so hard. I twisted and I turned and I, you know, it was so uncomfortable. How long do I have to sit here? All day. Well, that was impossible. How was I going to do that? I wanted to get out and play. And then I sat there, and then she asked a question. I knew the answer. And I leaped out of my chair, and I went right over to her, and I said, It's two! It's two! I know my mother taught me that last night. I know I'm so happy. Everybody, it's two! What? You want me to go back to my seat? Well, but it was two. You want me to learn to? Put my hand up first. Oh, I can do that. I knew I could do that. So I sat there and I waited for the next question. And then I heard it. And I knew the answer. And my hand went right up. <gasps> Boom! But she wasn't looking at me. So I waved with my hand to get her attention. And then I waved more as if I was flagging her down. And then finally, I took my foot and wrapped it around the leg of the chair. And I dragged it across over to her because I knew I wasn't supposed to get out of my chair. And I looked at her and I said, it's four. What? Put the chair back. Sit down. Be quiet. And what? Wait till you call my name. Oh, it's Diane. And I sat there and I thought, this is getting so hard. How am I going to do this? And I started to drift in my mind, and I wasn't enjoying school. And the one word she kept saying over and over again to everybody, concentrate. Well, I didn't know what to concentrate on. She was so boring. What do I concentrate on? And I looked around the room, and I looked at all the children coloring, 
circles and staying within the lines. I wouldn't do it that way. I would take the crayon and I go all over the page, all over the page. What? I know, be quiet, sit down and concentrate. Well, what was I gonna concentrate on? And then it happened. I discovered it. I found what I was going to concentrate on. And it was the windows of the classroom. And I sat in my chair and I stared out those windows and I saw myself riding a white horse. I was going to save the world. I was going to grow up and be the Lone Ranger. <laughs> and I had my white horse and I would gallop and I would gallop and I was galloping in my seat and I was rocking back and forth. At what? Huh? No, I don't have to go to the bathroom, teacher. No. What was I doing? I was concentrating. Ooh. Well, anyway, I got to tell you this. Do you know that I got so good at concentrating? that by the time I got to grade three, I failed the whole year. I can't tell you how that felt. It felt absolutely awful. To fail in front of everybody in the class on the last day of school, when they were handing out the report cards, and she called my name and said, I had to repeat a whole year of school all over again. I was so sad. I started to cry. And then when I went home and I was going home, my imaginary white horse, I, I couldn't ride him. I was just so sad. We were just walking. And I said to myself, this, I don't like school. And then my mother sent me to a new school. And it was there that very first day of school, I was out in the recess yard talking to my horse, Silver, when this nun walked up to me and she said, Child, who are you talking to there? Oh, your horse. Oh, I can see that. What a beautiful horse you have. But he's got to wait for you. When you get out of school, he'll be right here. I promise you that. And you are going to come into my classroom. And you are going to learn about the explorers, your mathematics, and the saints. You're going to love it here. Well, I certainly loved her. I made a beeline to sit at the front seat so she'd always notice me. And the way she taught school, oh, it was so inspiring. She opened her arms up really wide and she'd be pointing to the right and pointing to the left. And then she would walk up and down the aisle and she had a veil on her head. And every time she moved, that veil would float behind her. And then she had these rosary beads wrapped around her waist. And they made a sound every time she walked. Cling, 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 cling. And I said to myself, I know what I'm going to be when I grow up. I'm going to be a nun. <laughs> well, things didn't work out that way. Anyway, I loved her. And I was so lucky. Because not only did I have her for grade three, I had her for grade four, I had her for grade five, I had her for grade six, and the last day of school, just before the graduation was coming up, she called me aside and she said, Child, I want you to represent the entire school on the last day, 
It's going to be in the gymnasium. Now, I have this book here, and it has a beautiful poem called Beautiful Things. And I want you to read it. And I want you to know this is going to be a big ado because all the parents of all the children are going to be there and the bishop is going to be there. I know you can do this. Wow. I was so excited. I got on my horse. I galloped all the way home. I took my horse up to my bedroom. I sat him on my bed. I looked at myself in my dressing room mirror and I said, I'm not going to do it like this, Silver. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to memorize it. And I practice and I practice till I got it perfect comes the last day of school. They call my name to the stage. I walked out. I stood there. And then something happened to me. I saw everybody staring at me. And it started to scare me. But it wasn't until I looked up at the balcony in the gym and saw the bishop looking directly at me. And I thought to myself, he can see every sin I have done in my life. And I couldn't remember one word of this poem. I almost started to cry. But then I imagined my horse beside me, nudging me, and saying, <laughs> You can do it. Pretend you're your teacher and say it the way she would say it. And all of a sudden, I opened up my arms really wide, and I acted it out the way she did when she taught school. And you know what happened? I said that poem so perfectly. I got a standing ovation. I couldn't believe it. I was so excited. I took my bow and I walked off that stage so proud. And there was my teacher waiting for me. Oh, child. Oh, I was so proud of you. Oh, I must admit, when you forgot, when you forgot the words, and I was so nervous for you, and you didn't even have the book with you. Oh, I thought I was going to lose my veil. I thought it was going to pop right off my head, and, oh, well, then everybody would find out what's underneath. But you made me proud. But I want to tell you something. Come here. Sit down. You know, it's no secret here at the school. Us teachers have been very worried about you all year long. What's going to become of this girl? You are run away with your imagination all the time. You're always with your horse. You're talking to yourself or you're talking to Silver. And you, your concentration you're not concentrating on the academics. And oh, no matter how hard I tried, no matter how hard I, I, I tried to get you to do the math and the geography, you just wouldn't listen. Well, not that there's anything wrong with that, really. But I'm afraid to tell you, and you must be very brave, child. Because bad things happen to good people. We don't know why that is. We don't know why we have to suffer the way we do. Oh, I've been praying for an answer for that all my life. But what I do know is the answer awaits you in the future. Are you going to be a brave, 
person? I'm sorry, but I have to repeat you for grade six. You failed the year. Oh, I cried so hard to think that I failed in front of my favorite teacher in the world. I was trying so hard, but I just, I just can't concentrate on those things. They just don't interest me. And I'm such a failure. I'm so stupid. And I, I just didn't like it anymore. And that was the day that I gave up on me. That was the day that I took an oath, a vow, that I would never try anything again for fear of failing. So I gave up on me. It was the worst summer vacation I ever had in my life. I had to tell my family, the kids on the street, my relatives, it was so embarrassing. Failed grade three, you failed grade six. I was getting too big for the classrooms. So my mother moved me to another school. And it was there in that school that I sat at the back of the classroom in the last seat, towering over all the other children who were looking at me calling me Dumbo the Flying Elephant, that I was really stupid. And people started to bully me and pick on me. And I had no friends. And when I didn't have any friends, I really depended on Silver to be my imaginary friend. And I used to run around the recess yard pretending I'd be riding my horse screaming at the top of my lungs, hi old Silver away! And then some kid yelled out, she's a retard! And I was so shocked. Now back then, we really didn't know what that word meant. But what we did know is that these were people who were hidden from society and people were afraid of them. And someone thought that's what I was. It was so frightening. And then something happened in the classroom one day that I never, ever forgot. There was a girl who had these terrible seizures where her skirt would wrap around her neck revealing her underwear, and all the kids would laugh and howl. They thought it was so funny, except for me. I didn't think it was funny. And it was the first time I was so brave that I got up and I told everybody off. Something I could never do for myself, but I could do it for her. And the next thing you know, I'm entering high school, and I failed grade nine. And then I failed grade nine again. Now I want to make it perfectly clear. It wasn't because I was stupid. It simply was I was not interested. Now what is someone like me who has no education? What does she do with her life? I, I had nothing. But then my mother reminded me of something. She said to me, you were born with a beautiful gift at your imagination and you're gotta use it. You're going to be something very special, but you gotta use your imagination. Do you remember those hand puppets I made you when you were a little girl? How you used to get behind the puppet theater and, and all of a sudden you weren't afraid to get out and act out with all the puppets and 
Everybody was cheering and clapping and everybody loved it. I want you to go back and do that again. And I saved them for you all in this little box. So I took that box and I went behind my booth and I created little stories, Punch and Judy, and it was really wonderful. And then this other kid that I knew had a magic box. So the two of us went and got an agent. And we went around entertaining birthday parties and bar mitzvahs and, oh, we got paid 50 bucks and we shared and split the cost and we thought we died and went to heaven. We're going to live like this for the rest of our life. And it was so successful. Life couldn't be better. And six months later, my friend Doug comes running into my house so excited. Have I got great news for you? What? We got a booking someplace, Doug? He says, well, no, it's something even better. What could be better? I won the audition. I am going to be opening on Broadway in the musical Hair. Oh. Oh, but I'm, I, I'm so happy for you. I love you and I'm so proud of you. And off he went. And you know, he became the most famous magician in the world. You may not remember him, but his name was Doug Henning. And he went on to tremendous success. And when he passed away years later, it was David Copperfield who took over in his place. And uh, I've often thought of Doug and how proud I was to be part of the beginning of his dream. But there I was all alone. Well, maybe not really alone. I had my horse, I had my puppet theater, and I had all my little puppets. And with bravery, I went out to do the performances by myself. Then one day, the phone rang. And when I answered it, it was this lady. And she asked me, would I come and give a benefit performance for people who are mentally retarded. I said no. Why? Well, I didn't want anybody to ever think that I was like that. After all, that kid called me that name in school. So I declined. Then she called back again, wanting me to reconsider. I still said no. Then a week later, she called me back. And she said, you know, a lot of famous people give an awful lot of their time. Why can't you give some of yours? So off I went, packed up my puppet theater and my puppets, went to this place in Toronto. And I was so scared. I was scared when I was setting up my puppet theater in, a, in this big room that all these kids were going to come in and they were going to be so violent and they're going to rip my puppet theater apart and tear off the heads off the puppets. But I was so surprised. They all walked in so, um, well, normally, if that's what you want to call it. And as I was performing, and they were applauding me, a young girl in the audience had a seizure. And do you know that everybody got up to help her? 
Nobody was laughing. Nobody was making fun of her. They were helping her. And I got thinking about that girl in my classroom. And I asked myself, well, just who is retarded here? And it's us, the normal people, if you want to call it that. And then I thought of a quote I once read in a book that Einstein said, that great spirits always encounter violent opposition from mediocre minds. And that was the day. That was the day when my dream opened up with such passion that I knew exactly what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And what was I going to do? I wanted to do something that would inspire people to achieve more. So, I went to see a big institution, an institution in a city called Aurelia, Ontario. And I volunteered there for a day. And it was a place where all these people with these disabilities were housed because they were not allowed to be integrated into the community. They had to be hidden. There were no doors on the washroom, no forks and knives to eat with. It was so, so gray and so old and so awful that when I came home, I remember telling my mother how sad I was that people were treated like that, that they were living like that. But I had an idea, and I ran up to York University in Toronto, and I met with this very famous doctor, and I said to him, I have an idea. I believe that if we took all these people and we integrated them into the community, they would normalize themselves. He said, well, I believe in that too, but I don't know how to prove it. And I says, well, I do. I know how to prove it. I'm going to start up a theater company, and I'm going to call it Famous People Players. And we're going to be all dressed in black, so nobody will see our faces. Nobody would see us at all, and they will never know who is making this beautiful show that will touch people's hearts. And if they're really good, if really, really good, and get standing ovations and rave reviews, and then when people find out who they are, they're going to say, wow, I didn't know they were capable of such wonderful things. And he looked at me and he said, you think you can do that? I says, I know I can. And thus began the famous people players. Now, if you want to know what happened, I hope that you will come back next week so I can tell you all about those rehearsals and what it was like to put a show together. Thank you for listening. I'm Diane Dupuis, and this is where special happens.